Hey guys, the ghost here, and today I am going to show you how I make a challenge lock. Um, thought it'd be a fun one to do, so uh, that and I need to get some challenge locks made. Um, I am also, uh, real quick, just going to point out, I mentioned in the last video that I made was the uh, giveaway announcement video, or not the announcement, but the um, drawing video. Um, that I had something I was uh, really excited to come in the mail. Uh, it's finally here. It's nothing big, but um, I find it really exciting because I love these things. So anyway, uh, this is my new sticker with my logo. Um, yeah, so that's what I got. Um, if you uh, are interested in uh, swapping some stickers, um, shoot me an email uh, leave me a comment on this video or something and get in touch with me and uh, email is the best way to go by the way um, and uh, we'll swap some stickers but until then it's there all right challenge lock so here's what we got um, this is just uh, an Ilco um, lock that um, I don't couldn't even tell you where I picked it up um, if you've seen my past videos and you know, I, I get them from all over the place. Uh, but it was just a cheap lock. No, uh, no keys or anything with it. Um, I picked it, I got it at, and salvaged all the parts, but it is in the perfect position and to make a challenge lock. So that's what we're going to do with this. And I thought it'd be a fun thing to uh, show you guys how I do that. Um, so first thing I did after I got it and had it all ready to go, um, is I went through and all of my keys and I found a key that I want to use um, so uh, there's your bidding whoever winds up with this have fun uh, <laughs> um, so I found a key and then I went through um, my stock of pins which I've showed you guys in the past I've got this is from this is my kit that is been put together with Literally just um, all the cheap locks that I find, all of these that I find and I got and tear apart. Some of them are still good locks, some of them are not good locks. Uh, and I all, all I'm looking for is the parts out of them. So this is my pinning kit. Um, and that's what I got. But I go through, find pins that will work for this. Um, I've already gone through and picked out pins that will work in this, um, with a couple of slight modifications. A couple of them are a little bit long, um, which is, that's not where the spot where that goes. Um, some of them fit perfect. Some of them are a little bit long and I don't remember which one it was, but, um, okay. This one is one that's just and i don't know if you guys are going to be able to see this but you can see how it just kind of sticks above the shear line there um so when i am when after i chuck this up in the dremel and uh go to make it into whatever pen i'm going to make it into uh, i will file down and clean that end up just a little bit to make make it fit uh exactly perfect um but so anyway Picked out pins that uh, fit fairly close, and then I went through and found drivers, um, and you'll notice they're all different sizes. Um, and I do that because I try and make all of my pin stacks match. Um, so I'll load this and show you what I'm talking about. Hmm, what did I do there? Oh, God. I'm losing it today, guys. Let me try that again the right way. There we go. Okay, so what I do is... And some of these driver pins are going to get filed down too, so they got flat ends on them. You can see they're rounded right now, but they will be flat um, after I'm done working with them on the Dremel. Let 
but you can see my pin stack is fairly even and they're slightly off a little bit but like I said once I you know I'm not looking for perfect dead level I'm just looking for uh, fairly even pin stacks um, so that's what I've got and uh, we'll uh, I'll uh, pause this and we'll come back to it in just a minute after I uh, get set up for the next step Okay, guys, so here's what we got next. Um, I plan mine out before I get into it. And the way that I do this is just a basic rudimentary drawing. Obviously, I'm not an artist. Um, but so I go through and figure out what I want to do to each pin based off of the size and the position it's in. Um, and the size of the driver or on top of it or you know all of those things play a factor for how I decide I'm gonna make my challenge locks um, and what I do is I go through and I figure out what I want to do to each one and then I mark it all down so I have a diagram of exactly how I'm gonna make my challenge lock and what I want to do to each pin um, so going across and then I, I drew this to help keep it orientated so that I know exactly how it's going to go into the lock. Um, but basically on this, uh, starting on the end here, we're going to do a T-pin and then a spool and then a serrated and then a, just a standard leave it alone pin and then a serrated and then the drivers. Um, I'm going to do a diamond spool or what I call a diamond spool. Um, you guys will see all of these as we make them and go through the process but and then the top one or uh, the next one's a standard and then a serrated t-pin and then a serrated spool and then a serrated um, and then the uh, in the Bible I'm going to thread the first three chambers and then in the uh, core I'm gonna thread the first and the third chamber um, and I, I figured all that because on this first chamber, we've got a serrated driver and a serrated spool or a serrated T, serrated key pin, um, and because those are both serrated, I'm going to thread both the Bible and the core so that they interact with those serrations. Um, and then chamber two, we've got a standard and a serrated spool, and because that one's going to be serrated, I'm going to thread the Bible so that because those will interact. And in chamber three, we have a serrated key pin, so I'm going to thread that, and then um, there will be a serrated T pin in the Bible, so I'm going to thread that one. The rest of them, it's a spool, a standard, a T pin, and a double spool, or a diamond spool. Um, so there's no serrations that are really going to interact with anything there, so I'm not going to thread those. I'm going to leave those chambers alone. Um, but that's what I've got. So the next step is to get set up to go ahead and make these pins. Um, and you guys, I've pointed this out or I've, I've showed this before. Um, but this is kind of my setup for, um, making pins. I've got a hole in one side where my Dremel will fit through. And then the other side I have, um, where my vacuum hose, I have a vacuum uh, mounted under my desk here and the hose will come through and I flip that on it keeps it it's it allows me to kind of keep the dust contained um, and then the vacuum helps keep it evacuated so that uh, it doesn't get all over everything so uh, I'm gonna get this set up and then uh, we'll come back and start cutting some pins all right so what I do is um, Basically, I just use squeeze clamps and I clamp the uh, Dremel down to the table and I clamp the vacuum hose down to the table and then I've got all my files and everything all preset and ready to go. Um, and uh, we'll uh, chuck up a key pin and I'll show you what I've got uh, to uh, cut, start cutting those pins. Um, these are the files that I primarily use uh, this is a brand new set um, I picked these up at Walmart and when I pick files because I'll show you the way that I cut pins 
um, especially serrations and stuff. And other guys have other ways to do this that work perfect for them. Um, the easiest way I found is to, I, I like to turn my Dremel basically into a lathe. Um, and when you're using a lathe, you have stuff to kind of carve in. So what I did was when I found this set of files, I looked through everything that's on the shelf and this right here is what I'm looking for. This super, super sharp, sharp point. Um, because I'm going to use that. I've got this one right here that I use. Um, I'm going to use that to carve into the pen instead of using the edge of the file. Um, I, I like to use it as a... Um, uh, I like to take and just carve it in two. So you guys will see that process here in just a little bit. Um, but I wanted to show you the files that I use. Um, and I don't I don't just go out and buy them as soon as I need them. Every time I'm in the store, I kind of look through and see if I can find... Because you're not going to... Not every set's going to have that sharp point on it. Most of them are going to be fairly blunt. Um... And so whenever I kind of walk in through the tool section, I thumb through and look and see if I can find a set that has that super sharp point on it. And if I do, then I go ahead and pick that up and then I have it for the next time I need it. So, um, all right, I'm going to get a, a pin chucked up and, uh, we'll, I'll show you what we're doing. Okay guys. So I got this chucked up. I got it zoomed in so you can kind of see what's going on. Um, what I'm going to do is. The first thing you want to, when you chuck up a pin in your Dremel like this, you want to make sure that it's spinning as straight as possible. You don't want to get it in there cockeyed one way or the other, um, or your your it's just gonna your cuts are gonna be off centered and it's, it's gonna it potentially could mess everything up. So um, you want it in there as straight as you can get it. Um, and then what I'm gonna do is. I'm going to take the uh, file that I was pointing out earlier, and I'm going to come in here, because this is my first pin, uh, it's going to be serrated. So all I'm going to do is put some serrations in this. I'm going to use this, I'm going to come in, and I'm just going to cut in serrations. And then when I'm all said and done with that, I'm going to take, I've got 320 grit uh, sandpaper, and I'm going to come in, and I'm going to file, or just sand it down a little bit, clean all that up so it's nice and smooth. Um... We don't want to leave anything extra on there that's going to get inside and jam up our lock. Um, I'm going to go ahead and cut the audio on this because the Dremel with the vacuum especially, it gets super loud in here. So um, the next shot will be uh, firing this up and you'll see me do some cutting and we'll get this pin set.
Okay, guys, I hope you were able to see all that. Um, I got it zoomed in super. Come on, get the focus to cooperate. Okay, I got it zoomed in super, super close, so hopefully it's not too fuzzy. Let me see if maybe I can back out just a little bit. Maybe you guys can see a little bit better. Um, but all I did was just cut some nice, uh, decent serrations. Um, we got three in the top of this one, so I'm going to call that good. Um, the other thing, when you're chucking these up in a Dremel, you want to be very careful you don't over tighten, which is very, very possible to do. When you over tighten, you cut, um, if you over tighten, it will cut into the key pin. Let me see where my camera is at here. It'll cut into the key pin and make grooves. Uh, and you don't want that either. So um, the next thing I'm going to do is turn it around and I'm just going to hit it with the uh, sandpaper. We're just going to lightly finger tight. I'm not even going to use the wrench and tighten that up because all I want to do is just hit it with a little sandpaper and clean it up. All right. And that is our first key pin. And it's all set. So uh, I'm going to get the next one chucked up and we'll move on. Okay, next pin we're going to make is a serrated spool pin. Um, this is the driver pin for chamber two. Um, so what I'm going to do is I've got it chucked up here. First thing I'm going to do is cut the end flat uh, so that there's no bevel on there. Uh, when I make challenge locks, I like them nice and flat. Um, the bevel, um, I find, tends to be a little easier because it, it opens up the gap on the shear line. Um, and I want nice, straight edges. So, uh, I'm going to flatten that. I'm going to cut two serrations in the top of this. And then we'll flip it over and we'll cut the spool. Um, so, let's get to it. Now, like I said, you want to be careful not to over tighten, um, especially in this case, was because we've already cut a couple of serrations on there, so there's even less material for it to clamp onto. And if we over tighten, it'll really smash them down and uh, just makes for an ugly looking pin. So,
So I should also note that when I make my spools, I take the same um, carving um, file and I carve out the ends of where I want, or the, the edges of where I want my spool. And then I take, um, I take a saw blade, a hacksaw blade, and uh, go in and the hacksaw blade will, I'll use that to cut away the material where I want my spool at. Um, another way you can do this is to use um, your flat file. If it's got uh, cut uh, edges on it and you can use that and come in and uh, sometimes I make them like that as well so um, but you can use the edge of that and kind of take away the material you want but in this case I'm going to try using the uh, hacksaw blade I can see that my pin's starting to come loose. I don't have it quite tight enough. So I'm gonna open it up just a little bit, knock that back in there, and cinch it up a little more. Uh, you do also have to kind of be careful with doing this in a vacuum setup the way that I've got, because and you see the vacuum's right here. Um, I've actually had pins come shooting out of there and I've had to fish them out of the uh, vacuum cleaner before, so. There's also that.
All right, I'm gonna have to look back at the video and see when that uh, unfocused because I wasn't paying attention. Hopefully you guys saw that um, or got the gist of it. If it was out of focus, I apologize. Um, well, uh, let's see what we got. Okay, so here is here is our spool. Focus. There we go. So there's our serrated spool. If I can hold on to it, let me try that again. There is our serrated spool. And came out pretty nice. Um, all right, let's uh, we'll keep going. Okay, next pin we're making is a serrated T-pin. Um, first thing I'm going to do is make my serrations, and then we'll flip it over and I'll cut the T-pin part of it. Um, so I'll show you the uh, serrations and then uh, the T-pin. Okay, now on my T-pin, all I'm going to do is take any one of my flat files, and in this case it's uh, my round over uh, flat file. Sorry if this ain't focusing guys. Um, it, it's the round over flat file. And I'm going to use the flat side, and I'm using this one because it doesn't have a cutting edge on the the uh, narrow end. Um, it's just flat, and then it's curved on the top. So I'm going to use this one to come in and uh, just take off enough material to make this into a T-pin. Um, first thing I always do is hit them all uh, with the sandpaper it just kind of cleans them up makes it easier to see so you're not looking at uh, a dirty pen trying to differentiate or see um, where you want to make your cuts if you clean it all up before you start and then you can clean it up after you're done make just makes it easier to see and kind of see what you're doing so uh, let's get to it
So there is my serrated T-pin. And we'll move on to the next one. Okay, the last one we're, or the last pin we're going to make is a diamond uh, spool. Um, it's basically a spool that's got a fat waist in the middle of it. Uh, I call it a diamond spool because it looks like a diamond when you're done. Um, so in order to do that, I am going to use my uh, triangle shaped file and I'm going to come in and I'm going to do, uh, uh, an angled cut. Uh, I'm going to do an angled cut with the, the, uh, triangle shaped file going one direction and then I'm going to turn and go the other way. Um, and you gotta be, especially with as small as this pin's going to be, usually I only do this on super long pins. With as small as this pin's going to be, you got to be really careful not to go too far. Um, if you go too far, you're hosed, and then you get to start over and do it again with another one. So, let's see what we can do. Well, I will say this one did not come out near like I was expecting, but let's clean it up and see what we get. Maybe we can still use it. Hmm. 
Interesting. Well, I will say this is not exactly like I was planning. Sometimes I don't know. I can't hold on to nothing. So sometimes they don't always come out like you plan. But I still think it looks kind of cool. Um, I don't know. For some reason, it kind of reminds me of maybe like a trophy. So I think I'm going to go ahead and keep this one in there and use it. Um, hopefully we didn't get too thin on the top portion here and uh, made it too weak i think we'll be okay but we'll see so anyway um that is what we got there so i think we're at the point where uh let me let's see i got a couple more to cut and uh and we'll get them cleaned up and put the lock back together and i'll show you what we got okay guys so next we're gonna go ahead and thread the chambers uh, that we're going to thread. Now, when I do this um, for uh, my standard locks, this is a 6-32 um, tap. And this is what I use when I thread my locks. One of the first things we need to do is take the cover off the top of this. Um, and so all we're going to do is... Pry that out enough that we can grab a hold and pull it out. And that gives us access to all of our chambers. And then when I do this, um, some people do it by hand, and you can do it by hand. Um, just uh, you want to get it started. Kind of get it. You want to make sure you're you're straight up and down, and uh, uh, straight side to side. And then if you uh, just kind of get it started, you can take a crescent wrench or whatever, grab the tip of this, and twist it in. Um, I thread mine with my drill. Um, seems to work fine for me. You want to be careful when you're threading the um, core that you don't go too far when you go to thread the core if you go too far you'll start running into the warding and uh, it can actually push and bow the bottom of the core out uh, because there's no there's no metal here to keep it together um, and then you distort it and it's a great big pain in the butt so you got to be real careful when you're threading the core not to go too deep uh, and you'll kind of see what I'm doing here in just a second. But uh, So in the Bible, we're going to thread chambers 1, 2, and 3. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. And you can see where I just got it to where it's just poking through there. Um, and then back it out. And do it again. And you can feel... You can feel once you get to the end of it. Um, it, you can feel it no longer cutting. It gets super easy. You know that you've cut threads through the whole thing. You want to make sure don't force it. Um, and, uh, you want nice clean threads all the way through so take it kind of slow just let the let the tap do the cutting um and then back it on out when you're done and uh you should have threads all the way through let's go ahead and thread the uh core and in this one we're going to do chambers one and three
And in this case, I don't know if you're going to be able to see this. I'll see if I can. Um, see if I can get some focus. Uh, yeah, you should be able to see that. Okay, so you can see just the the tip of the tap. I just run it to where it just meets the top of that warding right there. That's as far as I want to go, and then I'm going to back it out. I don't want to go any further than that. So like I said, you can you can uh, start. You, it does two things. First of all, you can start spreading out the. Uh, sorry, let me work on the focus there. You can start spreading out the bottom of the core, and it distorts it. And then the other thing is, it will actually run into the warding, and it creates divots in the warding, and then your key won't go in and out. Um, it'll uh, your key. The grooves on the key will actually catch on those divots on the warding, so it won't work that. Uh, it won't work um, that way either. So um, I just run it straight in, like I said, to where the tip, the very tip of this uh, tap, just starts to touch that warding right there, and then I back it on out and call it good. You gotta be careful too. Um, you saw how it just jumped out of my hand. If you don't have a good grip on it, you got to be very careful doing this while holding it in your hands. If you're not holding it in a vise or anything, it can jump, it can it can uh, spin, and uh, anything on the back side of this can actually catch, and you can cut your fingers and uh, cause some damage to yourself. So be careful of that as well. Just touching right there. Back it on out. Um, okay, so the next thing I do is I will take my flat file and because um, after you thread those, it's it's mushroomed up the top of these chambers just a just enough that it creates just a little bit of a burr there that can catch inside the. Uh, lock or the Bible when you put it all together. So I take and uh, just knock those edges down so that there's nothing that's going to catch. And then in the Bible, I will take the uh, round edge of my um, uh, half rounded file and I will run that through just over the top of the chambers that we threaded there to do the same thing and knock out any potential burrs. You don't want to take off too much. You got to be careful otherwise you'll uh, you create a uh, you can create a groove or a gap in your shear line um, which can cause your problems the other way. So, um, when that's all said and done, um, I'm also going to take, um, you can take compressed air, uh, or anything like that, um, and kind of blow any shavings that are in there out. I take my, uh, compressed air or, uh, I'll take my vacuum, um, with the bristle attachment and kind of get those bristles in there and really knock that loose. Uh, that way there's no buildup or nothing, no metal shavings or anything in there that's going to cause me any issues later on. Uh, and in this particular lock, you can't, I'm not going to undercut anything. Um, you could definitely come in here. You just take your Dremel and uh, uh, a rounded or a ball uh, type of bit focus it's not going to hold on there we go okay so this is just a dremel bit and you can see how it's rounded um, but you can take that and you can chuck it up in your Dremel and you come in here and you very carefully just kind of cut out just under the shear line there. Um, you just kind of want to cut just a a groove in there basically. Um, 
and you can do the same thing um, on these only it's a it's a lot more difficult to do um, I've done it uh, it's it's super hard to do and not screw something up but it is doable um, on a couple of the chambers you're not going to really be able to do anything on three you're you can do a tiny little bit on two and you can do a little bit on one if you wanted to and then the same thing coming through the back side you can do five and and a little bit on four if you wanted to the other thing you can do uh, if you're building a challenge lock um, some of them have actually uh, grooves um, in the bottom of the um, or holes cut in the bottom of the uh, of the housing um, and you can come in through the bottom that way and cut your grooves your undercuts that way too so um, that's a possibility to go that route I'm not going to undercut anything on this one I think we're just going to modify the pins thread a couple of chambers and uh, call it good so I'm going to get this cleaned up and uh, prepped and I will show you what we got when we assemble it okay guys so here's what our final pins came out looking like um, and uh, I will point out there there's a reason that because um, I've been asked this before, there's a reason that I leave a standard on the top and a standard on the bottom. Uh, and the reason for that is if you have a standard pin and a standard pin that are always going to be sitting in the shear line, when you start, you are not going to have that flop um, when your lock is sitting uh, at rest. So no key in it. Um, and somebody's starting into it, you're not going to have that major flop one way or the other. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I've put together many challenge locks that have that flop uh, where I didn't leave a standard pin. Um, but uh, in this particular case, I went ahead and left a standard on both uh, the core and the Bible so that it should be a nice tight uh, lock when it's all said and done. So... Um, and then there's one other thing when I am getting ready to, when I'm done and I'm getting ready to put my lock back together, there's one thing that I use, um, to clean everything up and then oil it really well. Uh, and that is, uh, Remington's Rem Oil. Um, and these are, uh, cleaning oiling wipes. This is, so this is a two in one. Um, I use these on my firearms and they work awesome i love these things i have not had a problem with them at all um performance on them is amazing and uh there's no two parts clean it and then oil it this works to do both um and it, it works really well so uh i figure if it's good enough for my firearms it's definitely good enough for my locks uh and it works perfectly so i'll take one of these clean everything up um and oil it up at the same time and then put everything together and um, call it good. So I just wanted to pass that on to you guys. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. And then we'll come back and we'll put this together. All right, guys. So there's one last thing you got to do before you're ready to put this thing together. And that is pick out springs. Um, if you have options to a bunch of different type of springs, then um, you, you, know, you obviously have a big array of choices. Uh, if you don't, there's things you can do to uh, to change your springs to either make them lighter or heavier. Um, now, in this case, I uh, the way that I pick my springs is based off of the pins that they're going to be uh, driving. Excuse me. Um, now I say that because so I've loaded I've loaded all of the key pins into the core. And if you look, we have a, um, a, um, a super deep cut next to a super light cut, um, which means that when they're preloaded or they're loaded in the core, this super deep cut is going to be right up next to the shear line. And it's, it's going to be right there towards the top. And on this one where you have, um, a super deep cut or super light cut you have a lot of room before you're gonna hit that shear line that also plays into 
how I make my driver pans and what I'm making them into. Be mindful of if you have something like, uh, let's say, let's see if I can hold this up here and get some focus going. Maybe you guys can see what's going on here. So if you have something like chamber four here where it's, it's uh, super uh, shallow versus super deep, um, if you remember, we made um, like a, a double type or a diamond spool with a fat waist on it. Uh, and it's not super fat. It got, got a little more than I wanted to, but we're going to run with it. But you see how when it sits in chamber five, it is right up there on the shear line where that spool starts. So it's it's the whole thing's going to play into it and if you think about when that gets picked it's going to as you go over that fat waist it's going to cause that core to counter rotate and then it's going to drop back in which is potentially going to make whoever's picking this think okay i've got that one set um move on to another one when in reality it's not set but if this something like this were in um chamber four you can see that none of that um, two-step of the spool is going to have any factor whatsoever into how this is picked other than a little bit of the spool um, so be mindful of that when you're when you're deciding what your driver pins are going to look like based off of your key pins um, you want to make sure that you're using something that's actually going to to come into effect otherwise you're just wasting your time you can make a, a a pin that's got you know a lot of work into it that looks super cool uh and that's great but it's not going to actually factor into picking up the lock so make sure you're mindful of that now because of that and how my pins are going to interact i that's how i pick my springs um so on uh, on chamber two and chamber five, we've got a lot of room in the core uh, before we hit that shear line. So because our driver pins are even fatter, or not fatter, sorry, when they're longer, I want super heavy spring tension in both of those chambers um, so that there's there's a lot of fight there. Uh, now on the back side of that, in these uh, chamber one, chamber three, and chamber four, where they're super shallow, I want super light tension or super light spring tension on those, so that those are a lot more. They're a lot. They're more easily overset. Um, you got to remember when we're making challenge locks. As much as I love to see somebody be able to open up a lock. When I'm making a challenge lock, I am trying to defeat the other picker, uh, and I want to I want to set them up to fail as many times or as way, as many ways as I can. So I pick super light springs to go in those super shallow chambers, and I've got um, super heavy springs. And in this case, I've got two springs that I've doubled up. Um, so I picked heavy springs and then I doubled those up and I put them together um, so that it's they're super long and because they're super heavy springs they're gonna it's a lot more spring tension um, versus these other ones are super light uh, so that all of this plays into how you want to make a challenge lock and how you want it to put it together so uh, the next step we're at is, uh, putting this together and seeing what we got. So I'm going to go ahead and, uh, throw this all together and we'll come back and finish this up. All right, guys. So here's our challenge lock, uh, totally assembled, works beautifully. Doesn't seem to have any snags or catches. Key goes in and out just fine. And I think we are done. So what I'm going to do with this now is I'm going to put a special key tag on it. Uh, I will label it with this video number. And if you are interested in 
giving this challenge lock a try. Leave a comment on this video. Um, make it, uh, let's see. Let's put, um, put, put the words, I want your lock. Uh, and I will use that. I'll put a, uh, uh, an example in the description of this video. I will use that, um, that phrase, I want your lock, to randomly draw somebody out of the comments who and give somebody a shot at uh, taking a crack at this if you're interested. Um, and it doesn't matter where you're at in the world. Uh, I will... It shouldn't cost me too much to send this off because it's pretty small. Um, depending on the size of the box, we'll see what I can do. But anywhere in the world, I will ship this to anybody who wants to take a crack at it and wins the uh, comment pick. Um, I'll use a, the uh, comment. There's a thing where you can... Uh, most of you guys probably know about it where you can... It'll randomly pick a comment... Um, that has any particular phrase in it. So, uh, use the phrase, I want your lock. I'll leave an example in the description. If you want to give this a try, um, leave a comment, let me know. And, uh, I'll do a random drawing. Um, I don't know, maybe in like two weeks, I'll leave it up for a little bit so that everybody has a chance to see it. Um, I'll do a, a random draw, and whoever gets it, I will send it off to you, and you can have some fun with it. Um, we'll see how much of a challenge it is, and then we can just uh, pass it around from there, and everybody can have some fun if they want. So, uh, all right, guys, that's it. Thanks for watching. Um, appreciate it. Keep coming back, and uh, we'll see you the next time. Until then, keep it legal.